The first thing I was thinking about when I was walking around yesterday is your relationship to color and layer. Mm -hmm. So I had the very big privilege of being a visiting curator for the performing arts at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And while I was there, they were restoring a Titian. And I remember sitting just a bit away from the person who was restoring the painting. And there was a, there's a bull at the bottom of, of this particular work. And he said to me, what color is that? And I said, well, it's black. And he said, what color is that? Come here and look. And sure enough, the closer I got to the painting, black was not black. Black was blue, black was orange, black was yellow, black was green. And I had no idea that this could be done mm -hmm. with paint in that very specific way. So that what you see isn't really or necessarily the only thing that's there. Yeah. And I'm thinking about that in relationship to your work too, that it is multi-layered, multi, just not only uh, compositionally layered, but that you also have a particular relationship with paint on the canvas and how it affects what we see and the colors that we see. So can you talk a little bit about <coughs> your relationship to paint, to color, to layering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it starts off with the sort of like grounding approach to sort of set a tone to the painting. So I'll start off with sort of a, um, an initial color. This one was blue and you can see it echoing throughout the piece in different places, but that's to set the sort of conditions for my painting. Like, so there's um, a restriction to it. And then from there, I will play off that color and add that color to everything that you see. Um, and it's at various like amounts that helps it sort of have this um, level of investigation present where you can see yourself double checking and trying to like fat check what you're looking at. You're like, is this true to my eye or do I need to sit with it longer and investigate? Um, and that also comes from like the thinness, like painting thin layers. You allow there to be like this opportunity of um, more of a like visceral feeling, mm -hmm. like the water feels visceral, like some of the landscapes pieces feel more like um, tactile in that way. And that's coming through the process of keeping something flushed and smooth and then adding the like velocity to it, to, or viscosity, sorry, to it so that it has a different um, feel. So like the bird, the chicken, mm -hmm. it has a different feel to it because it's a slightly thicker approach to painting it. But the blue is still coming through from the initial foreground. I mean, the initial wow. ground I made. Talk a little bit about how we got here mm -hmm. and a bit of your journey as an artist yeah and also about this particular exhibition the title of it in particular so my journey was long so yours could be shorter was me thinking about um an heritage uh, ancestry a community that is passing down knowledge to you so that your steps and your moves next can be a little easier. Um, I think that that translated for me into an art space when I started thinking about artists from like the Harlem Renaissance and that big boom, and then how like the black canon or the black diaspora was created. You know, it was fully formed. We had black bourgeois from Harlem, like really creating this narrative of what it is to create art as a black person. And what it looks like to critique art as a black person. Um, I think. Those and who were those? Some of who were some of those Renaissance painters for you that well, pivotal, were very important. The pivotal ones, I would say, um, for this work in particular, it was the like underdog. I would say Richard Mayhews was sort of an underdog during his time, and then he was seen as like a surrealist that a lot of people didn't admire in the same capacity because he wasn't doing something that was familiar. He was stepping out of that comfort of the figurative. And for me, I felt like it was important to honor him. Also, he's turning 100 this uh, March. Oh, wow. So that was another reason for me making this title. It spoke in so many different volumes. And um, it was kind of me giving 
homage to him and the other artists like him, like Jacob Lawrence, like Aaron Douglas, and then even the writers like Ann Petrie, like, you know, um, um, like the, the way that they were writing and depicting the world still translates to how it feels today in some parts. So I, I always think of the importance of having that connection parallel or clearly connected. And then talk a little bit also about your experience with painting. When did you start painting? Why did you Ooh. start painting? Why did you start making things? Maybe yeah. we should ask your mom. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, I would say, well, I started painting, um, I started painting seriously my junior year of high school, but I was already applying, or I had already applied to an art disciplinary high school. So imagine like two years where you're not really taking any of the program seriously. And then something clicked when I went to pre-college and I realized that like there is actually a career in this field that I should like follow through with and pursue in ways that I never thought of before. But you were making stuff before. Oh yeah, I was making things. I mean, it was more so at that time um, assignment oriented. Like I didn't take on independent tasks yet. It wasn't something that was a part of my true practice, my home domestic practice. It was more so me facilitating so I can get like a good GPA. So okay, then, so let's go back even further because oh, you are, this, you this are this missing further. my thing, mm -hmm. which is that you were three or you were four. Oh, when yeah. I made my, like, my first painting that yeah. period. Okay, yeah, so I made like my first painting a lot younger. Like um, I think I wasn't even in like, what, second grade or anything like that. Like my mom still has like some of the stuff I would make and like give to her. And it didn't turn into like, oh, my son's an artist until much later on in our lives. Um, I think I was more oriented towards sports and mathematics at the time and art wasn't in my world. It wasn't even in my peripheral. So there was this one artist in DC, um, Cool Disco Dan. He was somebody who I realized like, oh, there's like an artist in our community at this stage. And he, even though he's not like making big pieces, it's more so about what he means to the community as a creative. So he spray painted all over DC, um, a lot of different locations in Southeast and Northeast, Northwest. And when you saw those markers, you knew that like he had been there and it was a testament to like following a similar path, you know? It feels like you're walking in his footsteps almost. So yeah, that was where it started. And then uh, I think my first like actual painting on canvas and brush was third grade. And um, that was just a random thing that I did and then brought it home. And then I never touched painting for like, t until 10th grade, I think, yeah. <laughs> Mom, when he brought this little <laughs> painting home, what did you think he was doing? creating and being free and expressing himself. Did it feel to you like a thing you felt he was going to do or that just that, did it feel random or? When the, the painting that he mentions was an abstract painting now that I know more of the terminology and I just thought he was having fun with paint. It was thick, it was thin, it was just different colors and different shapes, but it wasn't until he started drawing things that I thought he was crazy that I realized he had a talent and I was like, oh, he drew this and it, it was fun for him. He just sort of, you know, no big deal. But one day he came home and drew uh, some, take some uh, lining on the floor and changed his bedroom into a studio. And that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. Now we can skip ahead to... Okay. <laughs> so I took things more seriously and got a studio going. Um, still at that period in time, it was post that pre-college period where I saw other like students actually taking care of themselves with art. Um, I think when I was at Duke Ellington, there was a lot of um, the idea that you're just going to get the grade, you're going to like finish the process. And I felt as though a lot of the other students in my class were just like, oh, I'm going to return to something else that feels more comfortable and not as like um, as an alternative pursuit, not to call it like daring or anything like that. But just it was so different. So their households, I think, also didn't support it in the same capacity, which is why I'm thankful to my mother that she did. Yeah, at the time that it happened, it was heaven sent, I would say, junior year. If 
High school, yeah. I always think it's funny that people will say to you, oh no, you have to get a job and it's an important to you know, know when your check is coming and that you have your health insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you see them on the subway and they look like the most miserable people, not all, but oh, yeah. too many. Yeah, yeah. And no one ever talks about how horrible it is to do something you hate for 20 years mm -hmm. versus doing something you love and finding your way to help that thing support you in whatever way it, it looks, <clears throat> excuse me, in whatever form it mm -hmm. takes. And so when you were in school, was there a lot of that kind of painting and positioning of work so that, I don't know, somebody, you're, you're sure to meet the right people mm -hmm and to make the painting that the person wants to put above their sofa. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and that somehow that is, it commodifies the work before the work has a chance to speak for itself, before you even understand what it is you're trying to do. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your experience of that in school? Yeah, I think that a lot of <coughs> the instructors at the time um, we're more oriented to be honest about like how you can find a job with art and not more so how can you just be an artist alone, you know? It was more so how can I find commission work? How can I become a portraiture so that I can anatomically draw people out right so then they can ask me to make, paint themselves, that sort of thing. Um, then one of my teachers talked about graphic design and like all these different ways that creative outlets pursue into a career versus it being just solely can you be an artist? And I think that that was the thing that I had sort of um, like a distaste for because I was like, where is that knowledge? Like, I see that you all have become artists and you're now teachers and whatnot, but where is that knowledge that carries over? And I feel like there was one teacher in particular that did that for me, gave me that knowledge and that sort of perspective. His name is Stanley Scrabo. And he actually came to the show last night. I was really happy about that. Like, it was amazing. and. Um, it was a sort of thing where it felt full circle, like almost like the title itself. Like he was 27 when he taught me and now he's 27, I'm 27, he's at my first show, my first solo. So it was just like, you know, a little teary moment of that serendipity aspect. But um, yeah, seeing people move like that and, and be more oriented towards making like that nine to five sort of traditional move. Um, I saw the, in some form, disparity come over when they were like, it's time to apply for college. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, now it's the time to apply for like the other stuff that I should have actually been studying more versus being an artist or trying to paint two to five. <laughs> so how did you sort that out? And, and what conclusion, or maybe it's still evolving, did you mm. come to? Um, I think it's still evolving. Um, like my practice, I think it's still evolving. Um, but I think the conclusion at that time for me was that I needed to buckle down and stay focused on something that truly made me feel good when I made it and truly made me like stay up all night and really investigate that time. Like it felt almost like I was like playing a video game through the middle of the night. And I don't know if everybody has that feeling, but when you're dedicated to something that's like driving you to like stay through the late night to work on it, that's what I found in painting. And then I was like, oh, it doesn't feel laborious to me to pull all nighters it actually pushes the work in moments. Like you get into that, you know, sweet hour where things get a little, you know, ephemeral and then loose. And then you start making things that you didn't intentionally make. And I feel like I had that luxury because my um, studio is a live work now. So like how my studio was when I was younger, now my studio is just like that. And I'm waking up, being able to paint, go to sleep, and then think about the painting and see the painting going to bed. So it was a constant for me, it became a constant. And I think that was the difference between me and my classmates at that time. So you have a relationship with portraiture. Uh, you also seem to have a big relationship with water. Very much so, very much so. Um, portraiture, I think that comes from my academic upbringing and that relationship to understanding the importance of like drawing something anatomically correct. Like we did a, I don't even know how many assignments and studies for sophomore year of high school into senior year and all throughout. And we were just constantly trying our best to capture like the true essence of something. 
regardless of it being a portrait or a still life where you're trying to capture the true essence. And then I landed on figurative work when I started thinking more about the like black canon itself and like how there was a space where we were sort of leaning towards in like the figurative aspect and then how we sort of lacked in abstraction and then trying to find the marriage of the two. So that's where textiles come in because I feel like textiles is um, sort of an unspoken language. Like how you dress is also how you'll be perceived. Um, it's unfortunate in some circumstances, but that is the case in most situations. So. And so go back to this relationship with mm. water. What, what is that? For you so with because water, it's almost everywhere blue is everywhere blue is everywhere blue is everywhere water mm -hmm. is everywhere um i grew up i grew up um next to a wharf in dc and like always ate seafoods always buy like fishermen boats like all that type of stuff was just sort of in my peripheral growing up and then learning about like my father's past being from st croix um that was another connection to water and then learning about, um, no, and I just not even learning. Once I went to college, I went to Providence and that's areas of peninsula. So water just kept like being very relative to my practice and relative to me. So then when I started painting it, it became this place of investigation where it's the literally the literal place in between me and something else, mm -hmm. like something that I can't refuse as, um, as seeing it as like a foundation like it's something that you can't trust and you have to respect at the same time um water has no favorites you know so like that sort of thing sort of drove my idea of keeping water relative in the work um thinking about location and uh middle passage um like sort of echoing around blackness with water using water to do that i want to read you i went around last night and I asked a couple of people to talk about why they were here and what was mm -hmm. exciting to them about the show. Okay. And so I want to just read this to you. We rarely see people of color in paintings and if we do, they're probably Renaissance period in the corner somewhere. Black people are the focal point here. Many different complexions and modern people. It's cool to see people with more African features, African Americans in New York in a big space filled with people of many different colors. I feel like it, it, like it depicts a good image for our people today. Wow. Can you speak a little bit about the importance of race in your work and mm. for you? Well, I'm gonna ask that question after. So let's, so first, let's go the there word. first, yeah. Um, I think for me, I like to nod at a lot of different cultures within our race, within black race, black culture itself. And I do that to sort of unify like the black America in a way, um, because I feel as though with being black American, there's a lot of displacement in terms of where we're located and where our, our like, um, ancestry comes from in truth. So we kind of latch on to anything that feels pan-African, you know? Um, so I have that kind of echoing out in moments, but it's also a sort of thing where by doing that, there's creating this moment of um, conversation between you and another person because you may have your own like traditions and understanding while the other person has their own understanding and that's where you meet and have a conversation. So that was also my way of forcing people to sort of like engage with each other more so. Like I felt as though no person or no one person should be able to understand the entire piece. Like you need a community to understand the entire piece. Um, or at least that's what I aim for when making these works. Let's just say it is so. <laughs> okay. And so do you feel that in this 21st century and just given all of our social and political freedoms uh, there's greater visibility of the rights of LGBTQ people and people of different communities. Do you feel you have the freedom to define yourself by what you do, which is mm. painting, versus someone looking at you and saying, well, this is, this is an African-American painter, or this is a young person, or whatever use 
yeah. whatever words they use to describe who you are versus who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm very intentional about that. Even in the write-up, there was a moment where we um, had the word political, and I was like, I want to take out political and just make it societal to like focus on the idea that I'm not just this um, function of like blackness. I'm a part of this bigger thing as a citizen. And um, that was like my way of sort of speaking to that through the work. I was using the um, like figures I felt that they had sort of a reverence and regal look to them, like they were integral. And I wanted to honor that um, as a contradiction to like the narrative of my generation, weirdly enough. Um, Which you I think is like, what? I feel like it's cyclical. I mean, there's like freak neek, like there was stuff that happened all throughout different periods. And um, I feel like for us right now, it's just, we're in a different space, we're in a different movement and the intentions are varied. Um, I feel like there's a lot of um, individuality that is contradicting a, a wholeness or a sense of unity that we should have. Um, yeah, so that's another reason why I make pieces that come from different aspects is because I know that back at home, your mother or your father told you something, you know? Mm -hmm. That's what I believe, you know? So that's what I try to like bring through with the work in some aspects. Um, I think about a lot of like African proverbs, um, uplifting, you know, quotes and things like that. But it's not the sort of thing that I'm like walking down the street just telling it to everybody I meet, you know? So what did your mother tell you that you think is in this work? Oh, well, um, my mother, I, I, I didn't actually say I learned it from her, but it was the sort of thing where um, my mother installed in me sort of a, a knowledge that was more focused on like, talent beating hard work, pretty much. I mean, hard work beating talent, excuse me. Um, it was sort of a thing where being able to watch my mother and see her in close time, it wasn't really what she was saying to me. It was more so how she was moving through her like job and how she had to like navigate spaces that were difficult. I was learning through more so the unspoken actions that she took versus her just laying it on me straight and being like, this is what I think of the world. It was like, you have your own thing to see and you can interpret it on your own, but just know that like this world is something I've walked through before, you know, like, so there were moments where things didn't make sense for me and, and she would have those type of answers just because she's already experienced it. So I've always tried to hold that level of respect for um, like her knowledge and the family's information. Um, a big thing that comes from my family is the idea that like you can't let your, um, education stop your schooling or oh, you can't let your schooling stop your education sorry but it's the sort of thing that when going to like duke ellington and when going to RISD, there's certain things that they enforce and they think that that's like what you need to move forward and i'm not you know dissing that at all i think you need that hard work aspect but then that gets to a point where the syllabus doesn't sit right with you perfect you know like there's some artists that you probably should be focused on that are not a part of the syllabus or there's a different direction that you should be taking that's not a part of painting alone so even at RISD I felt like and this is something that I've, is ongoing with other students they feel as though you don't get the opportunity to have intersectionality mm -hmm. like you don't get the chance to bring things that you've done in sculpture into painting and marry the two they always have you kind of like focused on one agenda, one major, one discipline. And I understand that in terms of like mastery, but I'm like, there's so much nuance that we're missing by not having this opportunity. But then they leave it to like open media. Sorry, <laughs> but I'm just like, we can work together and like it can be so much more than just mm -hmm. having it be this ambiguous statement of open media. Like we can say that this sculpture, painting, performance is all that and then some, you know? So that's, my take on that aspect of it. <laughs> and it feels a little bit like a banal question, but I have to ask it anyway, in part because I'm curious. Mm. What are the effects of social media on your work and on you with regard to what you, sorry. What are the effects <laughs> of social media on your work and oh. on how you approach work and how it affects your work also? Um, I think for a point in time, I was subconsciously influenced by what was happening right in social media, like seeing other people and like seeing what they were doing, seeing the like praise and flowers that they were getting. And then me coming from a place where like I know technique, I know craft, I know styling. I was like, 
almost thinking to like dress up my work so that it appeases to that system. And then I stepped away from that. The second part that came up to me was when I realized that Instagram is someone's art. Why should my art sit within their art, like as an artist, you know? So it was the sort of thing where I felt as though I was giving Instagram more validation than I was giving myself. And I didn't like that. So there was like those certain things that were coming up. And um, yeah, I think that the exposure is cool. Um, I feel like a lot of people get misled by that sometimes too, because the think? number factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it, it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not blaming them because there is some, something there in that for them and they get something from it. So I'm not knocking it. But for me personally, it just didn't serve me and it didn't honor what I was trying to do. Talk about scale. I'm, I'm always very curious about why one makes something this big versus this big. Mm. And maybe really it has to do with what it is that you're saying. Mm. Uh, when I think about it in terms of music, there's a, a lot of, of um, currency given to a singer who can sing a lot of notes and who has all the all of this mm -hmm. in the voice and <laughs> i feel like they miss the point of someone like abby lincoln mm -hmm. who could destroy you with one word and one note mm -hmm. and so let's talk about that analogy with regard to the to paint and yeah to talk about scale for me i was approaching it as like a big um sort of like a moby dick moment like the giant whale that you're trying to capture um all these start off blank so that's like really daunting especially when you're in your house it's a work home situation for me so night and day blank canvases you're like, so you're deciding size before you decide composition yeah and oh. with these i decided size before i decided composition because I had already, I already had done paintings close to this size or this scale, and I was just like, I know that I want the time to like have it be larger, so I can investigate things in a different way and have a different touch and a different approach. Um, I feel like when you also have a piece that's a little larger, more eyes can see it together versus a piece that's right here. So if it's right here, I, I can tell you what you're looking, what I'm looking at, but you can't see it until I give it to you, you know? And instead of having that as my um, point of reference, I wanted to make something that like, everybody in this room can see this painting right now. You know, I wanted that to be the sort of thing where like 30 or 40 people can have that moment of witnessing the thing and then possibly creating the dialogue and talking about what they see, what they witness. Um, it was more so a effort towards creating community. That's why I chose the size. Oh, wow. <laughs> No, we you, learn, we learn. Mm. Right? Yeah, we learn. Hmm. And so you are working on this exhibition and what is it that's inspiring you? What is it? I know that I know the title mm -hmm. of the exhibition, but even how did you get there? Um so oftentimes, like in the wee hours of my practice and working, I come across a couple phrases, like little mantras I make for myself, and I'll jot them out and save them. And all of these titles are like saved snippets of some type of poem, I guess, you know? Um, the reason, the driver for my work right now is sort of thinking about how can I stand adjacent to something already existing? And what does that look like? Like, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about Richard Mayhews and how big his work is for me. But I also made the point to tell them, I was like, I'm not trying to be like Richard like Mayhews Jr. Like, you know, that's not my intentions when honoring his work. Like, I look at all these other artists, like my friends are in some of these paintings and what they've made is in some of these paintings as well to like bring them into a more present state as well like to immortalize them in this current period and um i think that doing that comes from me understanding the um power of making the power of painting like certain things can be distilled in time by doing so yeah 
How do you feel what you're doing now has evolved and is different than what you were making in school or? Ooh, um, in school, I was definitely chasing my assignments. I was chasing all of my assignments. I did not really think about putting like my full essence into the assignment because I was like, we're gonna get a new assignment at the end of today. Like, why am I pouring out my heart in art form for that? So it just didn't feel justified. So I would do like things. I wasn't like, you know, trying to just get by as an artist or as a student, but I would work hard, but I wasn't involving myself to the degree I think I am today. Um, I don't think I even had the reference to know how to do that and think about doing that. I think that came from me just being able to sit with what I'm making more and more and just process like what direction is going into, where is it moving away from, who is it dancing closer to, like all that type of Great, proximity. so just answer that. Where is it moving away from and what is it moving toward? Okay, um, I think that with this like style of making, I am moving away from like the idea that as a young person, as a young people, we don't have an understanding of history. Like I'm showing that history is something that we know in so many different ways now and we have the exposure to know more than most of the people around us because of it. Like that's what I want in terms of the community aspect. Like I want you to feel as though you're looking at a bunch of snippets pulled from different places so that at the end of it, you're like, oh, I can make my own contention or my own reference of what this is. And it, it starts sort of an entry point for that curiosity to grow. But I feel like if you don't have those things, then you're not gonna get there. Mm -hmm. And you won't be able to see like the progress in terms of what I've done with the work I've been making. Um, I think that I've also found like how to play certain notes in the work. I, so what does that mean? Um, playing certain notes, I was making more of a reference to like uh, music then. Um, like when you get more masterful in your chords and your chord switching, and you know what you're doing at that point. You feel like you're not just like, oh, I want this to be ambiguous. You know, like that's not going to do anything for you. But are you disparaging musicians here? I'm joking. It's oh, a joke. no, I was processing what you were saying. I wasn't. Y'all are so quiet. Nervous and about serious? that. But yeah, no, I'm not disparaging musicians. I'm, I'm I feel joking. like that's a space where you can be ambiguous. Like you have like um, the Coltrane family, ambiguous, ambiguous. Um, like harp rhythms, ambiguous trumpet playing, like they were just filling it out and it works in that space. But it's not ambiguous. And I think this is a, a big part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. So when people think about improvisation, for instance, mm -hmm. they think you make it up. No, but you play your more familiar chords though. Uh, it is composition. Okay. Improvisation is composition. So you're not, mindless or unintentional about the sound you make, the quality of the sound, what notes you play, what notes you don't play. Mm, mouths. It, it is not an ambiguous thing. It, mm -hmm. it is about composing something in the moment right then and right there. And so I would have to say that I imagine it's the same thing for you. So mm. you have here what maybe someone would say these little white dots, mm -hmm. which is not what they are for you. I don't think that's what you intend for people yeah. to view them as. But the person who is identifying them as dots can also think you're being flip or you mm -hmm. thought it was, and you just, you put them all over the painting and that they don't have any, any real meaning, but they are in fact composed. Yeah. And so I want to be careful about using the word ambiguous mm -hmm. because I don't think there's anything ambiguous here. True. Okay. Yeah. Like, I want to go back to when you asked me about my skills. Mm -hmm. um, my compositions are finished before the scale is, that's for sure. Like if you saw me making the pieces, I have like all the references, the photos, all that stuff laid out. And then the scale is just me figuring out where I want to paint it on. Like me learning certain techniques, you can work at any size. That's not like the special part about it, like for me at least. Um, but for me to do it at that size, I knew that it was going to be impactful for a community, like versus 
it being a one-off, like, um, let me just pass you this thing. But the ambiguity, I feel like, what I was meaning more so by that is when I was in school, ambiguity was the scapegoat uh -huh. to everything that you expressed. Okay. So it was the sort of thing where you'd be like, oh, why did you choose this figure, this color, da 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 And if you didn't have an answer, where do we land? Ambiguity. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, like personally, as an, from that aspect, it didn't um, facilitate the same meaning as it does in music, where we're more accepting of the, um, that sort of awareness, because it, it does feel more intentional in that way. But when I was hearing that as a student and I'm paying for student loans and stuff. You can't tell me ambiguity when we're critiquing your work. It just doesn't sit well with me. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm like, you made it for some reason. And like, even though like with my assignments, I wasn't pouring into it and making it like this heavy thing. I made it for some reason. I have a reason to make this. I have like an artist statement. So that side of it too was another part to understanding like making work and producing. Do we have any questions here? Yes, ma'am. So I love the work. Congratulations. I wanted you to um, give us a, yeah, a, t a talk of, through this piece. Mm -hmm. I see a lot in there, and we were talking about it. Of course, those aren't just little dots, mm -hmm. <laughs> as how it is stated. And, um, and really, you know, I guess your intent or your, you know, when, when you were creating that this particular piece, and then these two, um, actually, it's a big diptych in my mind, yeah. as I see, and so I've got a feeling like there's um, maybe two different universes and things like that, so mm. just speak on pieces. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say that the figures, oh, no problem. Um, the figures in my work, I call them voyeurs. Um, I say that they're looking from, our, from their world into ours, and then mm -hmm. like the stuff that they pull back is like little moments from the world we live in. Um, this piece, at what, um, at what cost do I stay or go? It is thinking about admission into more of a spiritual world, like that access, um, the, the sacrifice of going to like the next stage or the next plateau and what you have to do to get there, like what you have to give up. Like you can't hang out with your friends every weekend, you know, like there's certain things exactly turnstile the reason i did the um the piers and the turnstile was just meshing together where i exist today and how i travel that my access today is followed by turnstile and next turnstile but then if i was at the wharf like the mode of transportation popular mode of transportation would be a boat so it was just forcing those two things together and making it so that you feel as though this figure is tossing a coin that could possibly like make this person animated again and bring them back to a space where they are no longer in freeze frame, like asking for this higher um, aid. Uh, the chicken and the knife, the figure holding that, that's kind of referencing like the actual violence of sacrifice and um, showing that it is more than just a coinage or a ticket roll. Um, it, it's, it's, deeper than that and you have to do more like the the sacrifice is as high as the reward you know um so a life for a life almost and how about these two and then um this one the diptych this is the action of storytelling um so on the left side is saying well the title is would you believe me if i told you and then on the right side is would you believe me if i showed you and the figure on the right is drawing what the two figures on the left are talking about. Um, in another painting in the other room, you can see that this is kind of like a chronological moment from the other painting where they saw the sea monster. You can check it out another time. But back to this one, um, it's focusing on that idea of feeling like these are modern characters. These are characters from today's time. Um, I went on a trip and um, when I was in Lisbon, I saw the rooftops and I realized that these rooftops sort of echoed in different places that I've traveled to and been in growing up. Um, I, I think that like once I acknowledged that, I was like, oh, I want to bring that in as a way of being like present in today's time. Um, if you notice in the, all the other paintings, this is the only true interior, like in all my other paintings, like not just this room. 
but this is like the main interior and it was my moment of sort of like speaking to studio practice, speaking to working together, speaking to like problem solving and breaking down on things that you don't know the truth of, um, distilling mythology almost, that's what I was thinking. Um, the sea monster is something that echoes in my work. You can see it through other pieces. And um, that was sort of this mystical being that it serves as an obstruction or the invasion of, um, of a, a comfort or a space of privacy or a space that this shouldn't exist almost. Um, at least that's why I, I interpret it as. And this room, the color choice, the thickness of the color, that was all intentional. Um, I painted with more of a confidence than I did before. Yeah, because before it was like very thin. And I think that that came out of like a little like trepidation about like, what is it going to look like at the final product? How do I truly let go of those back layers? Um, how do I problem solve that? And, and this time around, I just decided to like really go in with those colors and let you know where colors are starting and stopping versus having it bleed in the same way and focusing on the relationship of them. Um, orange and the blue, the yellow, like the vibrancy of that canary dress, like it's all intentional to sort of like bring you in. And then the pieces on the inside, I, I might, am I, you good? We still following everybody? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the figures on the inside are referencing Moors. Um, I believe that um, like introducing them is a way of really revamping their history and showing like people of our time that we have been a part of evolution and critical study for much further than most people realize. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I love that you pointed that out because at the top of that, that Pan-African like flower mm -hmm. is intentionally placed over the globe so that there's this idea of growth in the Pan-African section, you know, and I feel like that's what we're on right now. The, the Pan-African movement is very prevalent. We can't ignore it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? We have two. How you doing? Um, back to Africa. No, um, that is a, I got that from a collection of African mask books and they all just have like the descriptions of where they're from and the meaning behind them. If I'm not mistaken, that was a Sierra, Sierra Leone mask and it was referencing um, power, fortitude and the idea of um, flight. So it's like an eagle that they made as a deity of sorts. And I felt like she was in some form that character or embodiment of that deity. Okay. Thanks for the talk so far. One question I have is, I think there's this idea that paintings can be sort of a record of their own sort of coming into being, but you don't mm -hmm. sort of know how the painting emerges until it's there. I'm curious because you reference a lot of your process around references and building up this sort of collection, of this whole world that you then paint Mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, when you paint a painting like that one, which obviously has so many references, is a lot of the discovery that you feel done before you actually set the paint to canvas? Or are you sort of surprised by what you make every time? Oh, no. The discovery is far before. Like, I'll have, like, photos out. I'll have references. Even my friend Hakeem. Hakeem, where's your hand? That's Hakeem back there. He's in this painting. A fellow artist of mine. That, um, we've known each other since high school, so he's been through this process with me, you know? And um, I asked him for the reference in that moment, um, like just so that I could have that inspiration as a one-to-one -one before the painting even got to this period, you know? Um, and I feel as though I sort of mood board my paintings. Like I'll have a collection of photos, writings, and I'll just like spread it out underneath a blank canvas and then just like keep looking at these things and then what comes from it thereafter is the figure that I had in my mind at first, the pose and position, now I have the clothes that I want to put on. Now I have like the adornments that I want to add and that comes from like me making the connections between the two. It's like sort of um, knitting almost, you know. 
So your process is far longer than of itself before you can complete the final product. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hakeem, you've known him for a long, you've known Nathaniel for a long time now. Can you speak a little bit about what kind of painter, person, creative person he was when you first knew each other, and a little bit about the evolution <laughs> of his work and what it means for you to be the subject of one of his pieces? Speak up now. Our like, beginning of our practice was very rooted in drawing. And um, like, like he said earlier, it's very rooted in giving the form and figures and the portraits. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. Um, Daniel, your titles are so beautiful, as well as the title of the exhibition. Mm. So poetic. Do you write poetry? Um, pastime. Not. Uh, I, I make sure it stays a hobby. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's personal. Actually, um, some of the titles are much older than the paintings. Like the titles have been living with me for years on end um when i'm feeling away or, or i catch a vibe you know and i'm like thinking about something i'll just jot it down i'll just like write it out and it doesn't make sense to me then mm -hmm. but then like i'll go back to it and like look at it look at the painting and i'm like my journey was long so yours could be shorter like that's a good title <laughs> you know that's kind of how it comes together you know it's literally like that fluid and um it follows that intuition i think the romantic aspect is just following like uh an outlet that's just natural to me i'm not intentionally making it so like blah 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 but it, it's it feels honest in those moments where i'm like this is the title like it may not have been anything like this before but now that i'm here and it's finished i can really name it like i don't really name my paintings until they're finished so the titles would sit there and wait just like okay well he's red and yellow so i'm not being picked my name's blue <laughs> you know it's that sort of thing but then like later on <laughs> it, um it's fully captured and it feels more revelatory to like what i was doing so what happens when they go away when they they get sold, your little babies are gone. Yes, they are. They yes. are gone. And yes. how are you how are you dealing with that? Does it feel Bitter like someone is taking your It's it's bittersweet. Mm -hmm. It is. Um I made a poor analogy before and I'm gonna make the poor analogy again. Um just disclaimer. Um it's the sort of thing where like you're a lion or no not a lion, you're like, oh sorry, you're in the wilderness as a wildebeest or a gazelle and you give birth in the Sahara right or the Serengeti and then that baby snatched away from you by a lion it can't walk yet that's horrible I know I just I, I gave the disclaimer <laughs> I gave the disclaimer for a reason it can't walk yet it doesn't have the ability to move on its own but it takes that like that sort of um killing of the darling for that to have a story like for the painting to now to be in a space where we are creating a narrative around it that's much larger than just the action itself, the action of making. Like, that's the connection I was trying to make to or convey when I had that poor analogy. Mind you, um, it's a poor analogy, guys. I know it is. Like, it's okay. But um, 
that's where I felt at that time when I was making pieces and then like staying up all night to make it, but then like it was gone by the next day and I was just like, what did I do again? Like, you know, I had to like ha remember and make sure that I got photos of it because I needed to have that reference so I can make other pieces. So imagine like you can't make all this work at the same time, but you want that sort of um, continuity to be present in the work. So you have to like stay in that idea that like, okay, I know it's gonna leave, but I know what attributes I need to keep. I know what like was important to me in the last piece. How can I nod towards it? How can I leave breadcrumbs, create new breadcrumbs? That's what happens a lot of the time. But it is the sort of thing where um, I have to treat it like it's not precious, pretty much. That's what I mean by that analogy. Like, you can't treat the thing like it's precious anymore. As soon as it's out there and in the world, it's in the world. So anything can happen to it. It's fair game. If all of this went away. I'd cry. And you couldn't make oh. one more dime as a painter, would you still paint? Yeah, um, I was making money before I was painting. So I'll make money after. <laughs> Fine. Oh, I mean, that's a real thing. No, like I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I want to close the evening by reading you one other thing that someone said mm -hmm. yesterday. I'm just so proud, proud to see my friend here in this room being talked about. That's what means the most to me. I love the forward push we're having in our culture. This is something that's going to be in history, and I'm happy to be here while it's happening. This is Nathaniel Oliver. Enjoy the rest of the exhibition. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>